For the first time in its history, the annual BRICS summit is being held virtually due to the global pandemic. The 12th convention under Russian chairmanship is focusing on strengthening cooperation amongst member states. Led by China and India, BRICS GDP amounted to 25% of global GDP last year. Growth in the bloc is faster than that of the rest of the world and also that of G7, although this year's pandemic has halted that trend. The summit has also been held at a time of tension between China and India over their shared border. What major challenges do these members face in dealing with the pandemic? And where does BRICS go from here? To discuss these issues, I'm joined by Dr. Wang Dan, Chief Economist at Henson Bank China, Anil Kishora, Vice President and CRO of the New Development Bank under BRICS, also Mark Slobada, Moscow-based International Affairs and Security Analyst, and later on, Dr. Martin Davis, Managing Director of Emerging Markets and Africa at Deloitte. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan. Uh, in Shanghai, let me go to you first. Uh, let's talk about this summit. Uh, four of the ten countries in the world, uh, worst affected countries uh, by COVID-19, are BRICS members. Uh, in 2020, growth in the bloc is projected to decrease by 30 percent. How do you think uh, that is shaping this year's summit? Uh, I think this will be a key theme, uh, and people will be talking about how to best recover those economies that are deeply in recession. Because we know that all those countries account for a large share of the global trade, and their recovery would be crucial for the global recovery. But we know that their recovery paths are vastly different. And this year, China has already reached the pre-COVID-19 uh, economic level. But for Russia and India, they have to wait until 2023. Uh, for Brazil uh, and South Africa, they will face the biggest challenges because their economy may have to wait until 2025 before they reach uh, the pre-COVID-19 uh, economic level. So in this background, um, the summit will have to focus on how to best provide a social safety net, how to provide enough food, medical care, and also other type of cash. Yeah, hopefully those issues will be discussed. Uh, Vice President Kishore of BRICS uh, New Development Bank, what are your expectations for this year's summit? Uh, this is, as uh, you have mentioned, the summit is being held in very challenging times. And I'm sure at the end of the summit, we'll have some guidance, some way forward, uh, which will help the member countries uh, negotiate and overcome the challenges in a much faster way. So we are very positive and upbeat about this summit. Well, Mark, in Moscow, this BRICS organization is not just an economic bloc, but also a uh, political and security one as well. What are you looking for this time around for this summit? Well, one can make an argument that BRICS is, or has been in the past at least, far more effective as a, a political bloc, particularly a bloc at the United Nations voting in favor of um, uh, national sovereignty uh, and non-interference in foreign affairs uh, against those countries who uh, would seem to uh, subvert the existing uh, UN-led uh, uh, UN Security Council-based um, uh, international order. Um, Russia's focus for this BRICS um, is on, on three themes, shared security, stability, um, and uh, innovative growth. And certainly all three of them touch very strongly on the coronavirus uh, pandemic because it is very much a security issue. Uh, there is no doubt that China has dealt far better with the current pandemic than any of the other countries in the BRICS organization. Um, and uh, they, the other countries have suffered proportional to their population, uh, but China, again, being the exception because of their extremely disciplined society uh, and government uh, in enacting uh, uh, restrictions, uh, social restrictions uh, that have been extremely effective. Um, Russia will be pushing uh, outside of the terms of the coronavirus. We'll also be looking at pushing for moving to a common BRICS alternative to SWIFT. 
Um, Russia and China have already tested uh, just this autumn uh, that they can um, exchange um, uh, digital currency across their uh, shared national systems, but there's no reason that this can and should not be extended through the rest of BRICS. The question is, are BRICS members uh, such as India and Brazil, whose current political leaderships have aligned them closer with the U.S., even interested in a shared um, alternative to SWIFT system among the BRICS members? Um, Dr. Wang, let me go to you in Shanghai. You know, some say BRICS uh, lack mutual economic interests. Uh, they say that you know, trade between member states now is less than $320 million do billion dollars a year and is actually declining. And they point out that uh, the BRICS trade, uh, you know, the uh, BRICS trade with the U.S. and EU is 6.5 times higher. Uh, what would be your response to these concerns? Uh, I think within the BRICS country, there is very strong momentum actually to increase the trade volume. But now the, difficult, uh, the difficulty after the pandemic is that China recovered much faster than the rest of the BRICS countries. So the recovery will be very, very uneven. And given the difficulty of all the other four countries struggling with the domestic political crisis or economic crisis, they have to actually increasingly be more reliant on China. Uh, that would include both import and export and economic assistance. And going forward, I believe the economic integration between BRICS countries will be deeper than what we see now um, because the alternative to the BRICS would be an even larger scope of some sort of economic cooperation or free trade agreement. And that is very hard to obtain under the current circumstances. So participating in this block will give all countries a new opportunity of platform for, for further dialogue to increase their trade coordination and also possibly political collaboration at some point. Right. Our guest in Russia talked about uh, a potential alternative uh, financial transaction system um, as opposed to SWIFT. Um, how do you think uh, that, that prospect looks like for now? Dr. Wang? I think to have an alternative uh, financial system to challenge SWIFT uh, yeah, is uh, relatively uh, unrealistic at this point because we know most of the trade in the world are still denominated by dollars. So people have to use dollars. And if for large economies like China and Russia, they hold a large trade surplus, if they trade in alternative currencies or by a different financial systems, they accumulate a large amount of other currencies, it will be very hard for them to use those currencies as international reserves. That's not practical after this pandemic. Um, but what would be more realistic is to rely in long term on some sort of electronic currency, a different kind of system to the current financial system, but that will be decades um, from now. Uh, certainly uh, a lot needs to be done uh, from now until then. Uh, Vice President Kinshara, uh, let me go to you. How has BRICS uh, New Development Bank been helping member states uh, coping with the COVID-19? Uh, New Development Bank, uh, in terms of responding to the crisis uh, for its members' banks, has been uh, very effective, I would say. Uh, whenever we speak about this, I am reminded of three words, speedy, bespoke, and material. So our response was extremely speedy. Uh, I think the World Health Organization declared uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic. Uh, somewhere around 11th of March. Within one month, NDB was ready with its response, emergency response, and uh, we had a full-fledged policy, and uh, we have started dispersing uh, speedy loans within 90 days. And uh, in fact, the first loan was dispersed uh, sort of within four to six weeks itself. So a speed. Secondly, bespoke. So we took into account the specific requirements of our member countries and accordingly 
uh, created the program to offer assistance. Thirdly, material. As you know, a new development bank has a subscribed capital base of $50 billion. So that has positioned us in a very, very strong kind of a position where we could raise funding, we could raise resources in the international uh, market, in the China local RMB market, to raise the resources to fund our effort. And uh, we have put in place a $10 billion program out of which 40%, 4 billion has already been disbursed. Uh, basically, in the initial phase, we took care of the emergency requirements. The second phase would involve responding to the recovery requirements. And uh, we hope to continue. We are confident that we'll be able to meet up the requirements of our immediate requirements of our member countries uh, right. with this $10 billion program. And, you know, your president, Marcos uh, Troijo, said a few days ago that emerging markets play a vital role in the growth of global GDP. Uh, how do you see that happening given the ongoing pandemic? Uh, absolutely. I agree uh, with my president. Let me, first of all, uh, flag the, uh, the importance of uh, being a financier to BRICS countries. And... Uh, the, the BRICS economies have contributed, as we all know, a major portion of growth to the world economy over the previous, uh, say, 10 years or so. And uh, pandemic, yes, it has created disruption. It has created uh, temporary uh, kind of blockages. But given that we host almost 42% of the planet's population, there is uh, no dearth of demand here. And uh, we have to push for growth. And uh, I see that uh, COVID is kind of, uh, now China already, we all know that it is well controlled. India and other countries as well, it's uh, getting under control. So we are hopeful that we'll bounce back. And you will see that the recovery uh, is much faster uh, than probably we are able to project at this stage. Yeah, so, Vice President yeah, Kishora, yeah, thank you so much for all the work uh, that the BRICS Bank has been doing to help member states. Um, Mark in Moscow, let me go to you. Uh, let's talk about you know, some questions revolving uh, around this organization. Some pointed out uh, that uh, you know, the diversity of cultures over there, uh, countries, member states have different phases of economic development. They have different ideologies, uh, different definition of poverty and other cultural differences. Uh, how can, you know, under these circumstances, you know, how can these countries, member states, really come together and uh, help each other out? Well, everything is relative right now. Um, uh, we, the entire world is suffering from the coronavirus pandemic, and large portions of the world have been restricted to, uh, let's face it, uh, Zoom meetings uh, as, as a, a form of, of, of communication. So at least as far as communication around the rest of the world going, uh, uh, BRICS uh, has continued over the last year to develop uh, cultural and inter-societal ties, whether that be uh, the film festival, whether that be uh, uh, youth um, uh, political and development organizations under the BRICS auspice, uh, or technical and scientific cooperation. And one of the, the big possibilities I believe will be seriously discussed about this meeting is both Russia and China will be sh uh, basically um, uh, shopping to sell uh, their uh, coronavirus uh, vaccines uh, uh, to the other BRICS members and, and from there on. And I know uh, specifically India uh, and Brazil are both testing, at the very least, Russia's first vaccine, the, the, the Sputnik V. And so that's certainly a level of scientific and technical cooperation uh, that, uh, you know, the, the pandemic could actually uh, spark uh, some interest, uh, particularly, in, you know, in the biological and, and health matters, um, that uh, the cooperation hasn't been pushed uh, as far in the past. Uh, I, I think we'll see some renewed uh, interest in its relevance uh, in pursuing it further in the future. 
Right, Mark. You know, Russian President Vladimir Putin said the bloc's support for open markets and opposition to protectionism are stabilizing factors in the world economy and international political arena. Uh, you know, can you give us some concrete examples? Uh, what, do you th what do you think uh, Vladimir Putin really means by saying that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's quite obvious. That is a slap intended at the presumed outgoing Trump administration in the U.S. that has engaged in, in quite vicious and whole-scale economic warfare against China, against Russia, against any of the other BRICS members who trade with China or Russia, uh, with a whole raft of sanctions and tariffs. Russia, in the last four years, has been the subject of 46 different sanction packages uh, from the United States. Um, and this, um, uh, you know, idea of uh, using tariffs to try to leverage the U.S. economy uh, back in by force is, uh, you know, viewed certainly by, by uh, China and Russia as, as, as a, a outside the bounds of agreements of the World Trade Organization um, and uh, other agreements on free trade ar around the world. Um, so they'll be hoping that under a presumed president-elect Biden administration uh, that that will start to see some shift, uh, some change away from such measures um, and uh, that uh, you know, BRICS throughout has stood uh, kind of uh, interestingly China and Russia as, as the champions of, of global globalization, of economic globalization, uh, where the U.S. and uh, other populist leaders such as Brazil have uh, been kind of, well, shall we say, backsliding on that, if not openly revolting against it. Uh, Dr. Wang in Shanghai, uh, I know this uh, may sound like a geopolitical question, but I still want to get your expertise on that. Um, mm -hmm. How do you look at the you know, divergence, if you will, uh, different ideologies, political systems uh, among BRIC member states? Also think about China-India border disputes. How do you think this bloc can still maintain its cohesiveness and uh, foster growth? Uh, actually, this has been the criticism since day one of the BRICS creation. Um, but I think BRICS over the last decade has achieved more than what people have thought. Um, because during its first uh, official summit in 2009 held in Russia, uh, there were only about 15 identifiable commitments. But eight years later, when we look at uh, what has been achieved, there were actually way more than that uh, commitments uh, during the decade. And then since 2009, uh, we have seen that the BRIC countries have created more commitments and the compliance rate has also been quite high. Of course, China is leading the way. I, I think going forward, there is a much larger scope for the five countries to collaborate in a meaningful way because this kind of relatively loose uh, commitment will actually provide more flexibility to member countries Right now, all countries need a liquidity, but under the current rules of World Bank and IMF, it will be very hard for them to borrow. But in the BRICS framework, it actually has less strings attached and will help a faster recovery of those countries that are struggling with a domestic economic recession or with the pandemic spread. So people should have faith that uh, there is a future for BRICS. Of course, talking about BRICS, S stands for South Africa, and that is where our next guest is. Martin, great to have you with us. Uh, you know, as someone who's working right now in South Africa, how do you see this organization helping the South African economy and also your expectations for this current BRICS summit? Mm, oh, thank you very much. It's, it's good to be here. Um, Thinking back, it's actually 10 years, next month, since South Africa was invited by, by Beijing to join the BRICS grouping. Uh, it's, it, it hasn't come quite a, a club, if you will. But um, I think South Africa arguably has been the most enthusiastic of all the members, despite being the smallest. I think looking forward, especially in this sort of, dare I say, use the word post-COVID sort of 19 recovery, I think the biggest um, opportunity for us really is to, is to align um, sort of what has happened in South Africa and the region in commodity exporting economies 
our growth by and large, considering our export basket, has been largely underpinned by China's investment in infrastructure. China's strong recovery, strong rebound post-19, post-COVID-19 certainly, is very is, is, is undoubtedly underpinning and providing some sort of tailwind growth for GDP in this part of the world. I think to, to answer your question directly, what could we do, I think, in terms of that? Look, Brazil, Russia, India to an extent uh, are more economically of second to secondary importance to China for Africa here. And I think the alleviation of supply side constraints on infrastructure, uh, think rail, think ports particularly, and power on the African side can certainly further uh, solidify the relationship between China and Africa, uh, which is certainly the most, that corridor, if you will, is the most important uh, from our perspective, the view from Johannesburg. Right. Also, uh, you know, attention has been focused on the announcement of the BRICS Economic Partnership 2020 through 2025. Uh, given the current economic uh, uncertainties, what do you expect from this strategy, you know, for the next five years? Well, I think this, if we think back to, I mean, history has precedent here, late 20s, 1930s even, uh, the U.S. had a new deal, and I think the, the post-COVID recovery in some cases is relatively slow. I think South Africa, we're looking at almost a lost decade here of getting back to GDP 2019 levels. So I think it's, it questions the role of the state. The role of the state comes to the fore. How much does the state intervene in the economy? How much does the state enable? And this is almost a word we used earlier ideological issue debate that's been that's taking place here in South Africa. And certainly I think the, the lessons, experiences are also being debated of other BRICS countries, once again, looking at the likes of China, India to an extent, uh, of how do we, you know, what are the developmental lessons we can learn from each other going forward as aspirant developing emerging markets. In terms of the plan you talk to, uh, again, I think a lot of the uh, the BRICS has come up a ball to an extent. Uh, I think internal governance challenges, uh, economic challenges in the likes of South Africa, Russia, um, Brazil, certainly. Um, you know, the, we're looking at a multi-speed BRICS grouping here, and can a multi-speed BRICS grouping, very different to what it was 10 years ago, can we all have the same sort of common agenda? Perhaps, to conclude, perhaps there's an a, 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 um, alignment with the, the China-centric or China-driven uh, regional um, uh, comprehensive Asian free trade agreement recently signed and the African pursuit towards similar free trade gains in our part of the world. How do we start thinking as a BRICS grouping towards liberalized trade? I don't think there's been an agenda sufficiently in, 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 in years past. Perhaps it can be looking toward the future of BRICS collaboration. Intra-BRICS uh, free trade liberalization, I, I think that's certainly a, a short-term, medium-term uh, win to be had. Right, right. We have about five minutes left, uh, and uh, I would like to invite each of the guests to really give your advice and suggestions to perhaps policymakers who are watching our program on how you know this organization BRICS uh, can strengthen its functions and can meet its overcome their challenges uh, to make it more relevant, uh, you know, and effective. Um, why don't I start with you, Mark? Yeah. Um because of the current political leadership, particularly in India um, and Brazil and its closer alignment with the United States, I'd have to say that as, as far as, as politics and geopolitical BRICS goes, uh, the organization is kind of on pause. Uh, it hasn't necessarily retreated, uh, but um, it's, it's been put on pause by those two countries, uh, further cooperation. Um, and there's the hope with future governments, a uh, socialist government uh, in Brazil, and uh, some type of resolution between India and China of their border disputes is something more as possible. The biggest hope is, is that of the, 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 new, the um, new Development Bank. That is, has a life of its own outside of the political and geopolitical area. And, and that should be the, the focus, uh, finance and the New Development Bank, uh, uh, while uh, this political misalignment is, is going on among the BRICS members. Uh, Dr. Wang in Shanghai, what do you think?
Uh, I think the BRICS will have to focus more on the future uh, because in the past it would mostly talk about uh, infrastructure investment or uh, emergency reserves or some sort of foreign aid. But for the future, there has to be more focus on digital transformation, other transformative technologies. So it might need a different evaluation system for what kind of project to support, for what kind of framework we will have to set up because entrepreneurs and private sector will be the driving force in the future. And the BRICS has to prepare itself to better finance and help those organizations to grow. Right. Uh, Martin Davis, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with both, uh, what, is, what has been said there. I think just focusing on perhaps, I think I believe the geopolitical tensions amongst the likes of China and India prevent a, an alignment geopolitically, and that's undoubtedly on the backbone of the BRICS. I think the new development bank is interesting. I think with the, the, the COVID crisis, if anything, has exposed the um, questionable risk models of deploying capital into infrastructure, particularly in this part of the world in Africa. I think perhaps there could be increased harmonization of view towards sustainable financing the infrastructure from a new development bank. We're seeing it already. The, the NDB has been, been very proactive. Into, into South Africa in recent times and renewable energy assets, and that's to be encouraged. I think there's a significant opportunity there that the NDB can increasingly look at towards infrastructure, particularly sort of more, um, more how should we say, financially sustainable, bankable infrastructure that's around renewable energy. I think there's a lot of uh, scope for increased uh, collaboration there. But once again, politics aside here, we're all aspirant, aspirant developing emerging markets. We're hitting control or delete on many of our growth models but how do we start to sort of invigorate growth going forward by enhancing collaboration and deploying capital uh, in, a, in a manner that, that has maximum sort of impact investment and at the same time is also uh, sustainable. Yeah, Martin, uh, we have about one minute left. Uh, you know, this year's theme is actually innovative growth. Um, how do you see that happening? Yeah, I think, you know, I think many of us, uh, for many of the BRICS, I mean, you're looking at you know, Russia, particularly South Africa, Brazil, predominantly our, our growth models are very cyclical, resource-driven, resource-price-driven, and we tend to be price takers. Uh, you're looking about innovation. Innovation is, is, is growth beyond resources. And I think if, uh, you know, looking toward um, the likes of China and sort of the, the, the world economy, the, the center of gravity of growth undoubtedly has shifted towards the east, and COVID-19 has merely accelerated that trend. I think as we start to, to, to grapple with this challenge of political economy of growth, which Mark alluded to earlier, is how do we start to rethink our growth models? And uh, I, I'm not sure. It, it's a very complex issue, but one which, which, um, which BRICS, as a, as, as, an, as a loose association of, of aspirin-developing countries, how do we, in, I've got no answers here, but how do we enhance the collaboration toward a common purpose? Um, the rules are often challenging in the current sort of global political economy. Times are challenging. The global south, that's us, that's Latin America, is increasingly uh, marginalized. And I think whatever multilateral collaboration we can drive going forward uh, should certainly uh, be encouraged. I think that's the sort of general feeling sentiment here in, in South Africa. Yeah, multilateral cooperation uh, should be encouraged indeed. Uh, I want to thank all of our guests tonight, uh, Wang at Henson Bank China. Anil Kishora, Vice President and CRO at New Development Bank, and also Mark Siloboda, Mosfair's Analyst, and last but not least, Dr. Martin Davis, Managing Director of Emerging Markets. Thank you all so very much. And that will do it for this edition of Dialogue. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Wen in Beijing. I'll see you again soon.